Good evening, public and members of the Board of Supervisors. Um, under my county administration update, I have two topics. Uh, first and foremost is the coronavirus and economic update uh, brought to you by several uh, experts in, in our areas. And uh, if I can read all their names in a row, what they will do is follow one another in this presentation. Uh, we will start off with a health update from the Virginia Department of Health's uh, Chesterfield District's Director, Dr. Samuel. Uh, then we will have a safety update from Fire EMS Chief Loy Center, and then a business update uh, with a combination presentation from our Economic Development Director, Mr. Garrett Hart, and Danielle Fitzhugh from the Chesterfield Chamber of Commerce. That will be followed by our human services perspective from uh, Citizen Information Resource Director, Emily Ashley, and then an operations update from Scott Zaremba, Deputy County Administrator for Operations, and then last, a uh, fiscal, uh, administrative, and economic update, if you will, from uh, Mr. Harris, Deputy County Administrator. Uh, so we will lead off with Dr. Samuel, uh, Virginia Department of Health Director, with the others following afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for another opportunity to provide you an update on the COVID-19 situation in Chesterfield County. Next slide. I've traditionally been providing an update on numbers. So worldwide, we're over the five and a half million mark for total cases with 350,000 deaths globally. The United States, there are nearly 1,700,000 cases and close to 99,000 deaths. In Virginia, we have just over 40,000 cases with almost 1,300 deaths. And in Chesterfield County, we recorded 1,263 cases with 32 deaths noted on the VDH website. 18 of those who passed away were residents of long-term care facilities, and 25 out of the 32 were individuals over the age of 65. Uh, by way of reminder, the first case reported in Virginia was on March 8th, and positive test results for the first case in Chesterfield County came back on March 11th. Next slide, please. So the good news is that we have seen a significant drop in new cases in long-term care facilities and correctional facilities. I think this can be attributed largely to three things. First, uh, an improved supply of personal protective equipment to long-term care facilities, though there are still reports of inadequate supply chains to some. Secondly, uh, improved infection control practices, either done proactively or in response to cases in facilities. And thirdly, an increased testing being done in facilities, either full-scale point prevalence surveys which test everyone in a facility or more focused testing. Both help inform infection control practices. Over the past few weeks, most of the cases we've noted have been due primarily to community spread. Next slide, please. So we've been seeing a steady increase in case numbers over time. The dark red line on the graph is the seven day rolling average of new daily case numbers which is superimposed over a plot in green of the number of new cases per day since the middle of March. This increase can partly be attributed to increases in testing conducted in the county, some of which has been through fairly large scale community events over the past two weeks. The health department tested 304 individuals since March 13th. In addition to this, there have been several large scale community testing events in neighboring health districts since early May where Chesterfield County residents have been tested. Next slide, please. So these two graphs are taken from the VDH website and provide information about testing at the health district level. Both graphs on the right show the number of tests being conducted each day since mid-March in the Chesterfield Health District. So both graphs are actually identical. Yellow lines, however, on each show something different. For the top graph, the yellow line indicates the rolling average of tests conducted by day, showing an increase in testing capacity in this district over time. There have been just over 11,000 tests conducted in the district to date, which is the fourth highest number in the Commonwealth. The graph on the bottom shows something different. Here, the yellow line indicates the seven day moving average in the percent positivity of uh, test results, showing a high of around 28% of the test results coming back positive in mid-April, when testing capacity was extremely low, 
to a decline through the end of April and early May as testing became more available. The lower the value of percent positivity, the better. The goal is less than 10%. Even though we've been testing more in May, we've been seeing an increase in the percentage of these tests that come back positive, which is reflected in an upward trend in percent positivity. Higher percent positivity can indicate that not enough testing is being conducted to identify all the infected individuals in the community. Again, part of this could be due to the relatively recent increases in testing, which has found more positive individuals who otherwise didn't have access to testing. We want to get to a point where there's consistently high levels of testing so that positive individuals can be identified earlier, leading to a downward trend in the percent positivity rate. The Chesterfield Health District is at 17.5%, up from 11.8% three weeks ago. Next slide, please. So without a vaccine, containing the spread of an infectious disease like COVID-19 requires separating those who have the virus from those who don't. Here are the four main component, components of the strategy on this slide. So with regard to testing, the top left, there are continuing efforts to make it more widely available through three primary approaches. The first of this is community testing. Uh, the health department in partnership with the county is providing community testing to vulnerable populations, specifically those who are under or uninsured. Secondly, increased private sector testing, which has shown improvement over time. VDH at the state level is availability through primary care providers, urgent care centers, and other venues, including businesses. And thirdly, increased public sector testing. BDH has been making overtures to free clinics and federally qualified health centers to provide consistent testing to under and uninsured populations that would be consistent over time. With respect to the three other steps indicated, uh, isolate, find, and quarantine, case identification and contact tracing is key to containment once testing identifies positive individuals. Again, the goal is to separate those who are sick from those who are well. EDH is hiring contract staff to assist health districts with identifying cases and then locating and speaking with contacts to those cases. This contact tracing is important to isolate individuals who have been exposed and potentially at risk of becoming infectious from spreading the virus to others. All of this work is extremely labor intensive. We're hoping to have all additional staff onboarded within the next six weeks. Next slide, please. We conducted four community testing events since May 13th, working again in partnership with county fire EMS and public safety in parts of the county with higher socioeconomic vulnerability. The focus has been to provide testing to those who are under, un, underinsured or uninsured. Telephone registration is preferred, but there is some testing available for walk-ups. Neighborhoods where we plan to conduct testing receive coordinated outreach through multiple agencies in advance. Here's a list of upcoming community testing events. Next slide, please. So in closing, I'll provide the phone numbers that county residents can call if they have COVID-19 related questions. At this point, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, 24 members, how many questions? Madam Chair, I, I've got a couple questions. Uh, Dr. Samuel, uh, you, one of the things we've heard about is uh, the possibility of a resurgence or a second wave uh, in the fall. Wondering if you agree with, with that assessment. Yeah, I think Time will tell in so many things, Mr. Winslow. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the prediction, I think, is premised a lot on the fact that uh, with cold and flu season, individuals, of course, will be confined. And, and until we have any sort of adequate protection measure like a vaccine, it is indeed very possible. You mentioned the vaccines, and we've I've certainly been trying to follow this. My understanding is that the virus has mutated 14 times across the globe that scientists are aware of, and that 12 of those mutations 
are currently in the United States. Uh, just wondering, you know, do you see this vac? Do you see this vaccine as a real possibility, um, or do you think that this virus will mutate and burn itself out? Just wondering what your thoughts are. Seems everything I've read indicates that the virus is mutating slowly, but I'm not sure what they're comparing that you know against what viruses they're comparing that mutation rate against. Right. Yeah, uh, coronaviruses in general do mutate, and, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm not up on the kind of latest uh, scientific literature. So, you know, even with respect to cold viruses, which many of which are coronaviruses, we do see those mutations. Um, with regard to a vaccine, I think there are efforts to target portions of the virus that typically don't mutate, and I think that's generally the approach when, when uh, uh, ideal vaccines are being developed and constructed. Uh, again, I can't speak to that with any degree of, of uh, certainty or expertise, I'm afraid. Uh, knowing what we know now after the, this first wave, what sort of things are you thinking in terms of if we have a second wave, what, what changes do you think are in order for uh, our locality and, and the localities in uh, the health district? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, I trust that we won't have to go to extreme social distancing measures, but I do believe that the new normal, at least for the, the near term, is to be practicing what many are doing right now, which um, uh, even inside of buildings are wearing face masks um, and, and keeping that six, six foot range. Um, so I think in, in uh, Kind of large measure, there will be behavioral changes that will have to be kind of integrated into our normal activities. Um, beyond that, uh, I, you know, a lot of a lot of it will sort of depend on trends as we as we kind of progress through the summer uh, with regard to wider scale opening. Um, I'm thinking educational institutions and so forth. So um, it, it's a, a wait and see a wait and see game. I'm afraid. Well, you touched on is my last question. I'm, the, the question I'm getting mostly from from citizens in Clover Hill is, you know, sort of predict what's going to happen in the fall. Where you know the families are trying to plan for their fall. Uh, what um, what do you care to offer any prediction as to whether or not we'll be uh, we'll be attending regular public school in the fall? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, a as these phases unfold, I think that's going to be kind of the true measure and, and, and certainly um, monitoring uh, case rate responses will be critical to that. You know, there are a number of different indicators that are being, that are being watched. Um, and, and I don't know what are, are specific to, to school-based decisions. Um, but, but beyond that, again, I think it, it is a, a wait and see game. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. All right, I'll, I'll turn it Thank over you, to Dr. the next. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. I'll turn it over to the next speaker to, to present. Thank you. Well, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Casey. This is Lloyd Center, Fire and EMS Chief for Chesterfield County. As a segue from uh, Dr. Samuel's presentation, I will touch on a few areas of interest related to the county's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As we approach the end of week 11 of the federal, state, and local emergency declarations, the county's Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, remains focused on various important objectives. Next slide, please. Providing compassionate and prompt care to those in our community who may have contracted the virus is foremost in everyone's minds. Over the past several weeks, total emergency incident volume has slowly been returning to normal levels experienced prior to the pandemic. In fact, yesterday's volume was about 11% higher than normal. Each day, there are certain numbers of patients who are treated by EMS that express symptoms typically associated with COVID-19. This does not mean that every one of these patients is in fact infected with the virus. It simply means that they meet the criteria for a COVID-19 alert to go to first responders based on the questions asked by the Emergency Communications Center at the time a 911 call is placed. While the number of COVID alerts yesterday were the highest, the highest we have seen in over a month, 
the number of alerts for the past week averaged 21 per day. This is lower than the daily average from the prior week and consistent with trends over the past month. With hospital volume remaining well below capacity and with consistent numbers of daily EMS contacts with symptomatic patients, we have settled into a manageable cycle for ensuring a continuum of care. Going forward, we will continue to watch for any increasing trends as more segments of our community reopen and react accordingly. Next slide, please. The small blue dots on the map before you represent urgent cares, physicians' offices, and pharmacies that offer COVID-19 testing to the public within or near Chesterfield County. The addresses for these businesses can be found on the VDH COVID-19 website under testing. Citizens should be aware that most of these businesses charge or accept insurance for these services and are encouraged to call ahead for testing criteria and payment terms. Testing is also available as needed through hospitals and primary care physician practices. As uh, Dr. Samuel noted, over the past month, the county's EOC has supported the Chesterfield Health District in providing community-based testing, as well as point prevalence surveys when requested by long-term care facilities. The larger blue dots on the map represent locations where community-based testing has been or will be offered soon. While testing may be offered multiple times at a given site, testing is not continually available at these locations. The health district first approaches the county's EOC and requests assistance with a specified number of test sites and provides an estimate of the number of tests that can be administered at each site. The county's emergency management coordinator submits a formal request to the state for National Guard assistance and the EOC team collaborates with the county's human services departments to identify underserved areas of the county that would benefit the most from these testing opportunities. From there, the fire department's incident management team, along with representatives from the health district and the police department, go out into the community and evaluate various locations for possible testing sites. The county's departments of citizen and information resources and communication and media then perform community and media outreach to promote the availability of testing. On the day of testing, the incident management team assists in setting up the site and provides logistical support while the police department directs traffic and provides security as needed. I know that our board members are often asked by their constituents why a certain location was selected for community-based testing while other areas or specific communities were not. A starting point in these discussions is the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index. This index is a composite score produced by an assessment of various demographic factors by census tract, including socioeconomic status, household composition, disability, minority status, language, housing type, and transportation. Areas with a score of 90 to 100% as pictured on the map in red are considered the most socially vulnerable. An ideal site is one that meets a minimum number of very important requirements. First, the site must be near vulnerable communities to better serve those who may not have easy access to transportation. Second, the site must have adequate space for equipment setup and ability to safely handle the number of residents to be tested. Third, the site must be capable of handling the expected vehicle traffic with minimal impacts on traffic patterns in the area. And finally, and often most importantly, the owner must agree to allow testing to be conducted on their property, as we're often dealing with apartment complexes or mobile home parks in many of these communities. Very often, community-based tests will be offered on county property near vulnerable communities as an easier alternative to resolving unfounded safety concerns or avoiding lengthy reviews of legal agreements some property owners may require. Some examples of sites that have been used successfully include Ettrick Park, Falling Creek Ironworks Park, and Stonebridge Community Center. Also, some locations are better suited to handle much larger events which will be important as testing capacity shifts more towards the private sector in the coming months. One such location is the Bellwood Flea Market on Jefferson Davis Highway. Next slide, please. The EOC team, as well as general services and procurement, continue to keep their fingers on the pulse of supply chains and the available stock of personal protective equipment, or PPE. Resupply efforts through the Virginia Department of Emergency Management 
as well as various contract vendors, has improved the county supply of PPE to a point that we no longer have critical needs. We have also instituted various PPE conservation strategies to safely extend the supply of items such as masks and gowns. In addition, the county is hosting a regional PPE distribution site at the fairgrounds for localities throughout a large segment of Central Virginia. Over 200,000 items of PPE have been distributed to date throughout the region. Hosting the distribution site does not move Chesterfield to the front of the line for PPE, but should critical needs arise, having the site nearby will cut down on delivery time and effort. Also recently located at the fairgrounds is a PPE decontamination system operated by the Patel Corporation on behalf of FEMA. The Patel system can safely decontaminate up to 80,000 synthetic N95 masks per day and can operate around the clock if needed. The service is available free of charge to all healthcare facilities and local governments. In the first week of operation, Battelle processed over 3,000 masks. Hosting one of the three Battelle systems in Virginia also produces benefits to our local businesses. The system now operating in Chesterfield includes 22 contractors who are staying in a hotel in Chester and purchasing food from local restaurants. Despite the bad news that we often hear throughout this pandemic, I've been encouraged by the outpouring of support and donations of PPE and other supplies needed to keep our first responders safe. From a resident donating a few N95 masks from their home workshop to a major corporation donating cases of hand sanitizer and detergent, our community has truly pulled together to support those on the front lines. Finally, many departments are pursuing grants that may be available to allow equipment caches to be built up in the event of a second wave of the virus in the fall. Through all these efforts, however, we do remain concerned about the ongoing availability of PPE as reopening efforts create demand from both businesses and our residents. In closing, I didn't talk about the myriad of human services needs in the community, but Emily Ashley will highlight later in the presentation the many ways that county employees and volunteers arising to these challenges. But I would like to add my thanks to one of her employees, Juan Santa Coloma, for his outreach in the Hispanic community that has helped our community-based testing to be successful. Madam Chair, that completes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions the board may have at this time. Board members, do, we have any, do you have any questions for Chief Center? Yes, I want to thank you all for such an outstanding job. Dr. Samuels, Chief Center, you answered my question, which had to do with the call volume we received during the pandemic. So thank you for having that information. I'm so glad I held off until you stated it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Center. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'll now turn the presentation over to Garrett Hart and Daniel Fitzhugh for the business update. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey. Thanks to your direction and support, we are in, and in partnership with Chesterfield Chamber, we have been able to launch several programs supporting businesses in Chesterfield during the COVID-19 shutdown. Daniel Fitzhugh, President and CEO of Chesterfield Chamber, and I would like to update you on those programs. Next slide, please. Chesterfield eats to go. Um, right after the first stay-at-home order was issued, um, board members suggested that we needed to let people know what restaurants were still open and providing um, curbside and delivery. Uh, working with the Commissioner of Revenue on a list of dine-in restaurants, uh, we created that list and then the economic development the team and the chamber team contacted each of those restaurants on the list to see if they would be open for curbside takeout or delivery. Using that list, we created a GIS map that you can access on your phone to identify the restaurants near your location that are open for pickup and delivery. Currently, there are 212 restaurants on the site that are offering curbside delivery or, and pickup. We are exceeding 35,000 page views on that site, and we have just added outside dining to the site information. Next slide, please. Danielle. 
Danielle, are you there? Sorry, you missed me. Sorry, I did a great presentation. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors. Relaunch Chesterfield is a partnership between the county and the chamber where we bought together businesses, not only within the chamber, but throughout the entire county that were separated into industry sectors that are working on plans with that are particular to their ind industry sector to reopen. We have eight industry sector groups. You can find those on our site at relaunchchesterfield.com. Those groups have work teams that they are putting together to develop their own white pages of what they need support with, where they need um, additional help to open, and if they can open. Some have chosen not to open through this phase one process. Some have said, here's what we need, here's how many people. Here is the occupancy attendance we need to be able to open. And they're working on plans uh, to be able to continue to do business right here in the county. Our next slide, please. Let's take it outside Chesterfield. In response to the phase one opening guidelines, we launched Let's Take It Outside Chesterfield. It's a website location where Chesterfield and businesses, where Chesterfield businesses can get information on how to reopen in accordance with the phase one guidance. It is particularly helpful for restaurants wanting to expand or create outside dining areas. In order to be allowed to serve alcohol on the new outside dining space, restaurants need to get a permit from the Virginia Department of ABC. The ABC requires that the locality approve the space as part of their application process. Working with community development, who created a 12-point checklist for local approval, we embedded the county application into the site, allowing for the restaurant owners to self-certify to the 12 points and to print a local approval sheet for ABC instantly. Currently, there are 78 restaurants listed listing outside dining on the Chesterfield Eats to Go website. Next slide, please. Ford RVA is a coalition of over 40 business leaders throughout the greater Richmond MSA, including our Chesterfield Chamber and our Chesterfield ED department. Uh, we are meeting three times a week to work on plans specifically for our region on opening and providing resources and toolkits for our businesses. Today was day one of a two-day campaign of giving out uh, PPE starter kits to businesses. In Chesterfield alone, uh, we gave out over 150 kits between our two locations at both John Tyler Community College campuses. Um, we had about 80 at Midlothian and about 65 at the Chester campus. We expect to have similar numbers uh, to slightly higher tomorrow, and we'll be there from eight to one giving out kits. We have about 5,000 kits throughout the greater uh, Richmond region being distributed. And once the two days are over, we will continue to have kits in our market to deliver uh, to businesses that weren't able to come out and provide them with not only hand sanitizer, glo uh, plastic gloves, face masks, some marketing materials, and some yard signs saying we're open, as well as some decals that say we're open. Uh, board members, uh, should you have businesses specifically in your region that you want to provide some decals to, let us know. And if you have further questions, next slide, please. I am very happy to announce our next new business assistance program, and I am very thankful to the Board of Supervisors for their support of this. The Back in Business Grant Program. Using $5 million of CARES Act funding, we will establish a grant program providing grants of $10,000 to 500 small businesses to support them through the phase reopening period. Applicants will be required to uh, document negative impacts of the COVID-19 closures. We plan to define final eligibility criteria and the application process in the next week. We will start to take applications and award, begin awarding applications in June. 
This completes our presentation, and we are happy to take questions, Madam Chair. Board members, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, and thank you, Danielle. I now turn the, the program over to Human Services Update. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you. Tonight we're going to be talking about human services, our highlights, and this isn't just county departments, but this is agencies and organizations all throughout the county that we'll be highlighting on tonight. And it just really shows that we're stronger together in all of these partnerships, not just for this time of the pandemic, but the connections that we're making that will last long after the pandemic passes. So next slide, please. Our first is social services. Social services, they have done a really great job. They are continuing to have rollouts all of the time, and they are really keeping track of all of these updates. Just this week, we learned that SNAP benefits will move to online delivery services. So people who have SNAP benefits beginning May 29th will be able to use Amazon and Walmart to be able to deliver their groceries to, to their home. So this is a great benefit for those who may have mobility issues or may have to be quarantined within the home. Um, in late March, we saw a spike of our benefit applications. And when we talk about those, that's SNAP, Medicaid, TANF. And we've seen those return to pre-pandemic levels here in the past few weeks. And the assessment and resource team, they're actively engaged in meeting the needs of the customers. They work closely with citizen information resources and our faith-based partners to make sure that people who have food insecurity, that we're able to use the food bank to be able to deliver food to the doorsteps and to be able to meet the needs of other services. And then of course, social services also continues to do their field assessments to meet the needs of the customers. And they're still going out into the community, taking all the precautions that they have to make sure that they're providing their services as normal. Next slide. Our mental health services, they launched Calm Connected Caring Chesterfield. This is on their Facebook page sites through our social media platforms and also their websites of just making sure that we're giving positive messages through the community that may cause anxiety, not only financial, but missing school um, or COVID itself. All of these things are covered in the Calm Connected Caring Chesterfield. And mental health continues to provide their regular client appointments. They have not seen a, a peak in their call volume. It remains the same as pre-pandemic levels. But what they have noticed is the no-show or client cancellation rates, those have actually gone down. And so their telehealth telemedicine is working really, really well. And so that's something that they're looking into possibly continuing after the pandemic because of those client cancellation rates just not happening as much anymore. Next slide, please. Our telephone reassurance program. This is our outreach program in citizen information and resources. Uh, this has been well executed. It's a daily call program to our seniors and they extended this early into the pandemic from four days to seven days a week. So we included nursing home, people who are feeling isolation because they're not allowed to have people come into the nursing homes anymore. Uh, that they are able to get that call. And we worked with the activity directors to make sure that we are calling people at the appropriate time to make sure that they're receiving these daily calls. And then we've really gone above and beyond just the call, but also partnered with juvenile detention, was able to, their annual plant program that they have, and because the plant sale was canceled, they are able to deliver a flower to not only each person in our senior reassurance program, but also the volunteers who are making these calls. And then juvenile detention is also making monthly cards that we're sending to our seniors as well. So it's just been a really warm, overwhelming response from the seniors that there's a lot of positivity to the program. And of course, we still want people to register um, and they're able to do so. And they'll be in this program past the time of uh, the pandemic. So once they're in the program, they're in it for good. This is not something that will be ending uh, once COVID is passed. Next slide. Uh, Chesterfield remains very connected. Again, these partnerships that we have, uh, we, they're able to happen because of our connectivity through our internet and through our social media services. So 
IST has done a fabulous job of promoting all of our Wi-Fi spots available in the county. Uh, you can go to the website and you can see which one is closest to you. We've had over 8,500 residents take advantage of this program uh, that to be able to get the Wi-Fi that they needed because they can't go into businesses or they don't have Wi-Fi in their home. So this is a great tool for them. Uh, our social media, it's a trusted source of timely information that the county is able to provide. So since March, the beginning of Mar middle of March, we've had 300 posts that are COVID related and it's reached almost a million people and it's caused 78,000 engagements. And then we've doubled our follower growth. Uh, the highest performing post was when our parks were announced that they were going to open with modifications and that cost over 3,200 engagements. So this is just a really great resource that we have for our community that we can stay connected and making sure that we're pushing out not only timely information, but also positive messages. We have a EOC call center continues to be staffed daily from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. They're averaging about five calls a day. So, uh, and it's just general information. This peaked when courts were reopening, uh, residents were calling, asking questions about courts. And then also we've pivoted to virtual learning. Courses that we used to have in person are now online. Our Chesterfield 101 class that we have targeted towards teenagers, we had last week. Uh, prior, when we had the course in person, we had about seven to 14 kids registered in the two classes we had. Last week we had 55 children go through the course. So this is a really positive program that we'll continue to have in a virtual atmosphere. And then the Council of Aging and many other board members, uh, board meetings throughout our different departments have pivoted to making sure that they're providing online lessons as well. Uh, next slide. Our community partnerships are just stronger than ever. Our letters of love, the social media post had about 8,000 engagements with promoting our letters of love. And we've had two rounds of over 400 letters that we've distributed to our long-term care facilities. And these letters are just really thoughtful letters to our seniors of just making sure that they know that the community is thinking of them. Uh, we've worked closely with schools and the Chesterfield Food Bank to make sure that we have a well-connected a program uh, to make sure that food insecurities are being taken care of. Uh, each week on Wednesdays, we meet with our faith-based partners. Uh, the Four Richmond group has also had a Love Your Neighbor campaign where they want everyone in the faith-based community to adopt a neighbor to make sure that they're taken care of. So all of our outreach programs are very organic and grassroots through our community. And this weaves the community partnerships that it makes people feel connected. It's just not a, a knock on the door and leave something behind, that there's actually conversations that are happening in a distance or a virtual platforms or, or people not knowing each other, but knowing that they're being taken care of. And we've had other nonprofit organizations uh, conduct food drives. The YMCA has had two food drives to benefit the food bank. So all of these really great organizations, we're all tied in together. We're working with each other to make sure that we have the most effective resources uh, for our entire community. And schools is also continuing to provide their feeding sites. They provide nearly over 100,000 meals on a weekly basis. Uh, and that's the supplement, of course, what the food bank is doing through their two drives. And many other church organizations are also conducting drives. So we, we really emphasize this really great partnership that we have with our nonprofit organizations. And we also, with our community partnerships, we check in with our daycare providers to make sure as people are returning back to work, returning to normal, that we're having conversations to make sure all aspects of our communities are taken care of. Next slide. So with that, again, uh, mental health, we know that that's important. So we wanna post that phone number that people can call 804-748-1227 and those appointments can be made and any other questions for the group will be happy to answer. Board members, do we have any questions? Thank you, Emily, for the presentation and to all of the teams and all of the coordination going on right now with all of these great partners in the community.
we'll be moving on to the next speaker. Thank you, Emily. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Casey. I'm Scott Zaremba, Deputy County Administrator for Community Operations, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide an operations update. I'll cover two topics tonight. You know, when I first started preparing for this work session, my primary objective was to discuss with you our reopening plans, but I think it's also important to talk services we continue to offer, so I'll start there. Then I'll spend a few minutes discussing the precautions we are taking to keep employees and citizens safe as we return to more face-to-face -face interaction to conduct business. Next slide, please. I wanna start with a brief look back at how we transitioned hundreds of employees to telework in mid-March. Immediately after the county announced it would be open on Tuesday, March 17th with reduced operations, IST became flooded with requests to equip employees for essential services, including deployments of VPN access, new laptops, and changes to voice communications. A large part of the task of enabling the county workforce would be to provide suitable laptops for employees who did not have a mobile computer and to reconfigure existing laptops and even desktops for use at home. This distribution and reconfiguration needed to be rapid, but also safe for all parties. Desktop services developed procedures and began to schedule employees for staggered appointments to pick up assigned equipment. Customers would pull into the parking lot to pick up the equipment at one of four lines and verify their logins, all while maintaining social distancing. Through this innovation and distantly safe process, 251 laptops, desktops, and virtual desktops were distributed to ensure employees could safely work from home. Additional software deployments were scheduled for after the customers left the premises to minimize in-person contact. Today, there are almost 2,600 employees registered to remotely access email and work files from home. Next slide, please. IST has also been instrumental in adopting new technology to allow us to continue to serve our customers. Microsoft Teams, shown on the left side of the screen, has been available to employees since December, but it's just recently become a lifeline for employees to connect and transact business. IST has also established a new automated signature process using software called DocuSign. The first customer was using it in production within two weeks of us signing a contract with the vendor. HR is now using it for new employee orientation that includes about 23 multi-page documents being completed and signed by the new employee and then verified and signed by HR and accounting. Community Corrections uses DocuSign to obtain electronic signatures from clients signing their intake paperwork. Other offices will follow as there are many uses for this powerful program. IST also designed and delivered an app in just 10 days to the Treasurer's Office that allowed almost 400 citizens to apply for payment plans online in the past five weeks. Later this summer, we'll have an additional work session to describe the impacts of the pandemic on the IT project portfolio. Next slide, please. I'm gonna briefly highlight four more areas that have used innovation to continue to meet customer demand. Chesterfield County Public Libraries were one of the first departments to step up. Pictured here, you see how they continued to provide access to print material collections via curbside service that allows checkouts, material requests, and hold pickup. Libraries as large as the city of Philadelphia called to benchmark with us and determine how they could offer similar services. Many are still not offering this valuable service. We also offer access to a virtual call center reference for homework help or assistance with just about any question you might have. The library has also quickly pivoted to modified program services via Facebook Live, including their popular story times and yoga. As successful as this has been, we still hope to open three of our 10 libraries by June 15th. Next slide, please. Like other departments, Parks and Recreation moved the majority of its full-time staff to a teleworking mode but they also had to furlough 187 part-time employees. This forced them to think outside the box and move staff around to cover duties such as animal care at Rockwood Park and at Henricus Historical Park. 
all their sections work together to create and share virtual programming so the public can engage and participate in healthy activities. These virtual programs and others in cooperative extension were shared on social media, posted on the main government website, and a virtual website page was created for easier access. The largest division in parks continue to work full time, moving to staggered shifts throughout the six districts to keep people safe while maintaining our parks. During this difficult time, parks and trails remained open, often seeing record numbers. And as it became feasible to do so, other amenities were opened up with signage posted outlining restrictions and guidelines for continued use. By June 15th, our goal is to open all three recreation centers and Rockwood Nature Center within CDC governored guidelines. Next slide, please. Everyone knows that public safety has remained open during these trying times, but I want to highlight our animal services function, which has continued operating at a high volume. Many employees are choosing to adopt animals at this time. We are performing all of our usual services via appointment. When the pandemic began, we sent over 30 animals into foster care with county and school employees. Citizens can view all of our adoptable animals online, select animals they want to view outside for a meet and greet, and if they decide to adopt, we process all paperwork outside. Next slide, please. On this slide, you see pictures of the courts building, one of our newsletters called Beyond the New Normal, and building inspections. I want to take a moment to focus on building inspections because construction in Chesterfield County has remained strong throughout this event and our workload of permits to process, plans to review, and inspections to perform are all above 2019 levels. Though the CD building is closed to the public, we have staff stationed at our entrance for those dropping off plans and permit applications. A large cart has applications and other forms available for customers that have not completed the documents prior to arrival. Customers can take the forms to their vehicles to complete, drop off the permit, plan, or payment, and then as soon as they walk away, a staff member goes out and retrieves the submittal. We're looking forward to adding a fully electronic permit application, plan, and payment submittal option this summer. We accelerated this portion of the ELM project months ago ahead of schedule to meet this need. Building Inspections currently has 25 inspectors who are working at home conducting inspections. Their results can be uploaded from their homes or at any county facility along their route, such as libraries and fire stations. Inspectors do not enter the occupied homes, but will utilize video or picture-based virtual inspections to get the job done. Building Inspections has done a great job of practicing spatial and temporal distancing only 10 to 20 staff members out of their 61 are in the office on any given day. Next slide, please. Again, I could probably go on all day talking about the tremendous work our county employees are doing, but let me take the rest of my time to talk about how we're preparing for phase one reopening. It's the county's intent to follow all recommended guidelines from the Center for Disease Control. Accordingly, we have created a reopening task force with multiple deputy county administrators on, administrators on it, as well as subject matter experts from risk management, general services, IST, and human resources. Our objective is a reopening plan that can be applied as consistently as possible across all departments while recognizing disparate needs. The county's reopening will not occur all at once, but rather in waves based on identified priorities. Such a tiered approach will ensure that we can maintain and gradually increase service levels while navigating the reopening process. A phase one self-assessment and transition checklist is completed by each department director as a guidance and planning tool before they reopen any services. Risk management, general services, and IST staff schedule on-site walkthroughs with each department to review the checklist and ensure that practices are robust and adequately addressed and, and mitigate specific potential risks. After action reviews will enable us to make mid-course changes if necessary to improve performance and ensure safety and health protection. Next slide, please. 
Here you see the main areas covered by our checklist. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this because we really want citizens to know they will be safe entering and transacting business in county buildings. Current data supports that the coronavirus is primarily spread from close person-to-person -person contact or from touching the eyes, nose, or mouth with a contaminated hand. Our reopening mitigation efforts focus on those primary areas of exposure. We will limit close person-to-person -person contact and reduce the probability of contact exposure to the face by working remotely whenever possible and using physical, administrative, and behavioral social distancing measures to ensure that person-to-person -person interaction is separated by a distance of six feet or more, or there is protection from physical sneeze or cough barriers. We will limit the maximum occupancy of work areas to reduce the total number of people in a given floor area and encourage frequent hand washing and staying at home when feeling sick. We will require the use of facial coverings and are working on how we may evaluate health or illness status before entering indoor work areas. All of these measures reduce the probability or likelihood of exposure at work. Additional announcements may be made after the Virginia Department of Labor and Industry develops and releases their emergency workplace safety standards. Our emphasis is on well thought out planning, proceeding with caution and doing the right things to protect citizens and employees by incorporating all the best guidance of health professionals, including the CDC, OSHA, and the Virginia Department of Health. Next slide, please. Since an estimated 30% of all COVID-19 cases are asymptomatic, and as a result of new guidelines just released from the governor, the county will require the mandatory use of facial coverings by all individuals aged 10 and up who enter a county building. This includes employees and citizens arriving to transact business. Appropriate signage will be posted in the parking lot so citizens understand the rules before they even approach the front door. Hand sanitizer stations will be provided in entrance areas. Floor markings and barriers have been installed where necessary, and we have begun enhanced touch point cleaning twice a day. Citizen access will be restricted to the first floor of multi-story county buildings for day-to-day -day transactions, such as making payments, submitting an application, or requesting information. Scheduled meetings and appointments on more detailed matters are the exception to that rule. Signage will be installed to indicate lower capacities for meeting rooms. By opening on June 1st for collection of tax payments, the treasurer's office will be our model for offices that follow. Next slide, please. We believe the treasurer has created a well thought out plan for next week based on the input of a collaborative team of experts with an emphasis on safety for everyone. 12 customers will be allowed in the building at any one time and lines will queue up outside the building this year. Citizens will enter through one door and exit through another. This office is primarily open to take cash payment transactions because all other payment options are still available and we do prefer those. There are contactless, no cost options for payment, including online banking with e-check fees being waived, US mail or by telephone. A second drop box will also be available so citizens do not have to come into the building. The treasurer will mail receipts for cash payments made in the drop box if a citizen writes receipt requested on the envelope. There is no need to wait in line. I'd like to emphasize that we appreciate everyone's patience during these trying times. Things may take a bit longer, but please know we are focusing on protecting employees and providing citizens with a safe and healthy experience. Next slide, please. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Madam Chair. Board members, any questions for Mr. Zremba? Um, Scott, I, I wanted to say thank you very much. I appreciate so much all the effort that um, you and your staff have put into uh, making this a safe transition for all of our citizens who are coming down there to conduct normal business. I mean, I think that the county um, generally has, has done very well and, and that the private sector, of course, is trying to figure this out as well. And so this, I think, will be a good model uh, for our businesses 
that are learning to cope uh, in this transition. So it's really a job well done here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, and I'll add my thanks to that. Uh, Our next presentation. I had, I, Madam Chair, I had one uh, comment. Oh, I apologize, Mr. Carroll. Uh, Scott, um, first of all, I, I think you put it, everybody's worked very hard and put a great plan together. Um, part of what I heard was that they're going to be outside lines. Um, are we doing anything uh, from a, a tent point of view to protect the uh, public in case we have inclement weather that may have to stand in a line outside? I'm just curious. Thank you. I believe the treasurer has put up some tents or will put up some tents uh, in the courtyard. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next presenter with the financial update. Madam Chair, members of the board, I have a pretty comprehensive update for you tonight that's going to touch on a wide range of financial and economic topics. So uh, please stop me at any point if, if you have questions because we are going to jump from topic to topic. And mine's a little bit more of a hybrid in that uh, trying to provide an update, as uh, Dr. Casey said, about sort of the economic backdrop. But at the same time, there are a number of action items uh, before you this evening. So this is really meant to give you the update piece as well as a preview and, and discussion period for a number of items, uh, again, that are wide ranging in, in, in topic area that are on your agenda tonight. Uh, with that, we'll go to the uh, go to the first slide. Uh, Try to put our heads together and think of the the best way to describe and show sort of the economic impact here. And, and th these slides are not in here for a, a fear factor uh, of any variety. But I think the reality is, you know, we, we talk about reopening and we want to make sure we're being responsive to, you know, the basic services that we need to provide. But the reality is, you know, sitting behind that is still a very challenging economy, and uh, you know it's, we're going to have to work hard to find that, that balance between providing uh, effective and responsive service, but also being mindful of the economic realities that are before us. This this chart here, um, and, and I'm showing tonight more U.S. information, just because we get that much more readily than we do local data. Uh, we still have very very little. Chesterfield specific economic data. I'll touch on a few points or how we're trying to really get on top of that, but most of what I have to show you on the economic front is U.S. It, this is the scale of this chart that I really want you to focus on. You see there are little, what look like very little bars uh, up top just north of the zero uh, on that sort of horizontal axis. That That's representing job growth in the broad U.S. economy since the, uh, really during the expansion period since the last recession. And on average, you know, the U.S. economy during that period is averaging about 200,000 new jobs per month. During the month of April, we lost uh, over 20 million jobs in a single month. So that's, that's representative of 100 months of job growth that disappeared overnight. And you can see what it does to the scale of what is a, a common economic chart, um, just just unbelievable. These these charts hopefully will never be uh, repeated. But I think this again, the scale is really what I wanted to impress upon everyone. And just a reminder that we we focus very heavily on the virus, but the economic impacts from the virus are are as real. Next slide. Same. General pattern here. This is a little closer to home. These are unemployment insurance payments for uh, Chesterfield County, um, and these are annual figures going back to to 2000. And you can see the scale again. Don't worry about necessarily the numbers themselves because they won't have any real context. But the scale of this chart, I think, speaks very clearly. You see, you know, what was considered to be the Great Recession in 09 and 10, and you see the uh, the, the spike there in unemployment insurance payments compared to where we are now uh, just through you know four months of 2020 we're already it dwarfs the worst year from from the great recession so again just trying to uh, to impress upon the scale 
of the economic disruption that we're looking at. Next slide. Retail sales, this is uh, some more recent U.S. data, and you can see, again, year over year, April sales down uh, almost 22%. That is the uh, the biggest decline on record, and again, you can see how it compares to the uh, period on the left-hand side, 0809. We thought in the Great Recession, but you see the, uh, the scale of this decline, again, far outpaces what we experienced the last time around. Um, I, I think the interesting thing here is we've seen, um, although overall over 20% decline in, in sales for April, our, our internal forecast for uh, Chesterfield was about a 26% decline. So that's what we had built into the budget. So we are, you know, we're on par with this. We, we like to be uh, more conservative than what we're seeing. So we feel pretty good about that. We don't have any real local sales tax data just yet. We have March numbers, but March was a, a mixed month as it was nationally, so we don't have the April figures yet. We will share those as soon as they come in. But I think the interesting thing is sort of one of those long-term impacts of what we're looking at. Online sales uh, represent now over 20% of total retail sales. They were up almost 9% during April, so you really are seeing a significant shift online sales uh, having some of their best months uh, on record. So. It will be interesting to kind of see if that bounces back into the brick and mortar world or if that uh, that pattern is here to stay. Next slide. Not having a whole lot of uh, official economic or economic data for Chesterfield, we are we have turned to uh, to non traditional sources. Um, Gerard Durkin in the uh, in the budget department has really taken this to heart. And you see here, this is actually vehicle miles traveled in Chesterfield County on a daily basis. And we are looking at this, uh, you know, not from a transportation perspective, but really as a measure of activity. And you can see, you know, we were averaging around 15 million miles a day traveled. That dropped down uh, really in late March and April to around 5 million. But you see that steady creep up towards the end of the picture here, back up to 10 million. And the last data point that's uh, plotted here, but this pattern has begun to creep back up towards that long run average of 15 million. So we're still 5 million less miles per day, but this does give us a much quicker read on activity levels in the Chesterfield economy. And certainly with some of the things that uh, Mr. Hart talked about, we would expect to see this pattern continue to creep up. But it, we have a number of these non-traditional data sources that we're using to track activity on a daily basis and not having to wait around two or three months later for uh, another data series to be published to give us a sense of what's going on. Next slide. So let me uh, jump in and again, we're going to skip around from financial topic to financial topic. I'm going to start with CARES. Um, we worked closely with uh, with Mr. Hart and his team to launch tonight the Back in Business program uh, as part of our CARES allocation. So there's there are three allocations for Chesterfield County in terms of CARES uh, that are really in play thus far. The school system is receiving some money, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, there's been an additional allocation within the Community Development Block Grant Program as a result of CARES. And then about two weeks ago, we got a letter from the state saying that Chesterfield would receive almost $31 million of CARES funding. Uh, that disbursement is supposed to expected to happen next week. Uh, we are still going through the guidance associated with this, but it is uh, cumbersome to say the best, to say the least. Um, so we will continue to review that for how you can spend the money. This one works a little bit differently in that they are going to send us all $30.8 million, and then you have to work within the guidelines to spend it all by the end of the calendar year. Um, our general approach, and I don't have a specific plan for you tonight because we uh, in Chesterfield, as they are throughout the Commonwealth, trying to figure out the rule book and make sure that we do not run afoul of the guidance that is out there from uh, the Treasury Department and others, but our, I think our general framework for spending these funds fall in one of three categories, and I just want to run through those for you tonight, not having any more specifics other than what's been discussed as part of the economic development package. First and foremost, we want to reimburse ourselves for eligible expenditures that we have had that were unbudgeted, unexpected and that have put us in a, in a tough financial place for the current year, and then things that 
Uh, likewise, we would expect to spend because of Corona in fiscal 21. So that's category number one. That's pretty self-explanatory. Category two uh, really looks at strategic investments. You can make certain strategic investments in the organization. A good example for us would be making sure that we are prepared for further telework activities in Chesterfield County so that if this were to happen again or if it continues to drag out or if there's a second wave, whatever it might be, that we are flexible enough from a work force perspective that folks can uh, can move about, work from home, be safe, and continue to deliver services. The third leg of the stool would really be those strategic community investments. You saw the beginning of that tonight and can't reiterate the, uh, the importance of that enough, $5 million for small business assistance. But there are other categories in those, in those strategic community investments that we are looking at um, and working with uh, folks in and out of the organization to try to figure out where there may be suitable matches for the community needs and the, the CARES guidance. So we're continuing to work through this. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it, maybe even in audit and finance next week. But certainly by June, as we go through your year-end actions, we'll have more specific ideas uh, really around the what we can reimburse ourselves for in the current year. So we are looking at the, sort of that three-pronged strategy as it relates to uh, the Chesterfield general government portion of CARES. Next slide. So let's talk about transition a little bit, shift gears to uh, a couple of action items that are on your consent agenda tonight. And I'm going to reiterate and recap what is uh, before you tonight and what's just informational. First and foremost, uh, there's a, a budget amendment. We told you back in April. I have to think very hard what month it actually is, uh, but I think this is May. So in April, we would have gone and approved a budget to get it in place by May 1. And we said at that time we did not have the state information and there would be amendments to the school budget and the county budget at the May meeting based on what came down from the state. So the next two slides really follow through uh, on that thought. Uh, on the school side, they reduced their budget overall by almost uh, a little over $23 million. You had taken action at your last meeting to reduce the county transfer by only about $2.9 million dollars. And remembering that the inverse of that, which I think is more important, the, the support for education from the Board of Supervisors is still almost $10 million more than the prior year, despite all of the other economic news that we've heard here tonight. So I think that always bears repeating. But uh, that $23 million, the school board took um, your action and coupled it with what happened at the state level to remove those $23 million. And I think Overall, we can get into the specifics if there are questions. There's a really good packet of information in your agenda packet, but I think the school board did a nice job of mirroring uh, their reduction strategies to what the board did, and uh, the finance teams worked together to make that happen. Things like eliminating the merit increase, um, which you know that pulls out eight plus million dollars uh, on the on the school side right there. But more importantly, preserving things like major maintenance, we have worked very hard uh, as a collective body to reinvest in major maintenance uh, categories and, and line items. And the school board took that very seriously and did not touch those as part of uh, this reduction strategy. There were state initiatives that were uh, removed, uh, mandates. So that saved some money to see the $4.6 million. And then a lot of discretionary items, the 12.7 that's shown there in the chart. And that would be akin to all of the additional funding requests that the Board of Supervisors either remove completely from consideration in fiscal 21 or just defer to some later date uh, in the year where we could revisit those. So uh, both sides followed the same playbook for, for the budget reductions that were necessary because of the virus. Next slide. Smaller bit of business on our side, the general government budget reducing by about uh, $1.8 million, primarily from, again, state reduction in, in revenues. We always work conservatively when it comes to state revenues just because they have a history of not showing up for one reason or another. So we didn't have to reduce as much as, uh, as some other uh, juris jurisdictions might have had to do. You see the specific line items that we took uh, monies from. Um, really nothing that would overly uh, impact service levels anywhere, holding additional vacancies as uh, retirements come online and uh, just looking and working very closely with the deputies to figure out where we can 
defer filling uh, vacancies so that we don't have any additional furloughs or anything uh, associated with this package, but um, not hiring for uh, vacant positions outside of safety sensitive frontline stuff and in some select positions uh, is really the, the big ticket item there. And then you see uh, deferring vehicle replacements again outside of uh, police cruisers or fire engines or those kinds of items. Um, and then you see down at the bottom, worth noting, one of the part of this math problem was moving some contingency dollars around so that we had a COVID-19 contingency for items that uh, we would need to spend, whether it's some of the things Mr. Zaremba talked about in terms of bringing services back sooner than we had anticipated or things that just aren't covered by CARES. We wanted to have some flexibility restored in this budget. So there's half a million dollars set aside for uh, COVID-related items that can't otherwise be covered by CARES or just things that uh, that we need to do to make sure that service levels are adequate for uh, for the community. Next slide. Uh, CDBG, um, a as you would expect, uh, and as I mentioned, they got some additional uh, CARES funding, and uh, Mr. Cohen and his team did a nice job of really just kind of going in uh, again, there's a, I think one of the revised items is related to the CDBG funding, and they went in and really just spread those dollars, uh, $861,000 amongst the uh, programs and lines of business that had already been identified. Uh, you see some of the examples there, local business recovery, rental assistance, um, homelessness assistance, foreclosure assistance. So things that are really, really in keeping with what CARES tries to encourage you to do but looked for uh, existing partners and existing programs that they already had so that they're not going out and recreating things uh, in response to CARES, but really just investing further in those uh, known commodities. So a nice, uh, a nice recommendation here. And again, this is on your uh, consent agenda as well. Next slide. Capital updates. There's nothing to do here, but I thought it was important to, to toss in because we've had a lot of questions on this particular item, and I thought it uh, was worth discussing. Um, really, our perspective remains that November is not an appropriate time frame for uh, a referendum of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars with everything that's going on. But wanted to touch on a few points related to capital because I think the, there's been a misconception, uh, particularly amongst the community, that because there is a referendum, that we're really shutting down our investment in capital facilities. And that's not true. Um, just earlier this month, we closed on a VPSA, which is a state program that allows us to borrow funds uh, for the Western 360 Elementary uh, near Magnolia Green. Um, and then we have a um, GO sale, a, a, a general obligation sale that closes out the last referendum, which is always important to make sure that you're following through on those promises that have already been vested to you. Uh, that will we will be working with the rating agencies and and closing that transaction in July. So uh, there's still a lot of of debt work going on to execute things that have uh, already been put into motion. Um, but uh, so just because there's not a referendum doesn't mean that we've slowed down on any of these projects that you're uh, that you're seeing here. We would expect to be able to push the referendum out just a year, and then we could begin borrowing. Um, off of that referendum as soon as January or February. So in, in terms of uh, you know delay, you're really only looking at perhaps about a six month delay in terms of being able to fund those projects. All of that said, as soon as the economic conditions sort of normalize, it would be staff's recommendation to come back, go back through the CIP and see if there are pieces and parts of projects that at least from a design perspective that we want to get started on. Uh, we know that there's some on, on the school side, some you know, some, maybe some middle school issues or whatever it might be, but those those opportunities still exist um, during the balance of fiscal 21. We don't need a referendum to begin design work on a, on a school facility. So, uh, overarching message here is capital plan still very very much in motion, and there are a lot of opportunities to to uh, move forward on this front. Although it won't be the full. Uh, full-scale referendum this November. Next slide. Also on your agenda tonight, and uh, related in many ways to uh, to capital efforts, there the state allowed us to increase an existing fee uh, for court security. We've all recognized how um, 
you know, particularly uh, Ms. Haley and those folks that to go into the uh, court facility on a regular basis, how that's changed over the years. So I think really in recognition of the increased security protocols, the state that allow us to increase this fee for uh, folks that uh, are, are found uh, guilty of various uh, charges throughout the court system from 10 to $20. It has to be used for court security costs, including uh, related personnel. But uh, certainly what we're spending there far outstrips the revenue that we're receiving to date. So increasing this charge from 10 to $20 would generate an additional $400,000 and working closely with Sheriff Leonard and his team to make sure that uh, we're being responsive to current capital and personnel needs on this topic and uh, as we move forward to make sure that we can make any uh, subsequent improvements. So this is one of these legislative items that uh, we're bringing forward at this meeting really to just set the public hearing for June. Uh, Mr. Minks will have a, a whole slate of other legislative topics for you in June, but to get a jump on this so it could be in place for July 1, we are asking to uh, set the public hearing for June tonight on your uh, consent agenda. Next slide. Um, this is a really important slide. I'll slow down just a second here and go through this. Uh, again, I apologize for the diverse amount of topics, but a lot of things to cover here tonight. This is a, a, a very important one. We want to make sure the message gets out on this. You've seen several examples here tonight of how we're working to help out our local businesses. Um, the utility division has uh, waived uh, penalties and fees on many of uh, on their monthly, bi-monthly bills. And I think that total is up over a quarter million dollars of relief there. Uh, we've done some things on occupancy taxes to try to provide some relief to, to that particular sector that's been hit hard. And sort of the one piece that uh, we wanted to continue to take a look at was what relief measures were we offering for just the, uh, your, your everyday uh, citizen. And so we have uh, worked very closely with the board and county administration, all the folks that take the phone calls every day, folks calling with questions and, and things for us to think about. And the number one thing we heard was uh, really trying to help out on the penalty for personal property. As you know, real estate is a different uh, animal. It is taken out in most cases as part of an escrow. It's paid twice a year. Uh, there's those mechanics that are built in to help you save and, and be prepared for those bills when they come due and really didn't hear very much, uh, if any, at least in, in, in my part of the world, uh, questions or concerns about the real estate side. But the personal property is once a year in June. Uh, that's not something where you have the built in mechanics again to save for. So we work closely with uh, the treasurer and her staff and so I consulted the board to put together a recommendation that's on your uh, public hearing agenda tonight to uh, do the following. Personal property taxes are still due June 5. However, if you cannot uh, make that date, penalties and interest do not kick in until July or until August 1st. So you have through the end of July and th through July 31st to make those payments without having to pay the 10% penalty, uh, which hits all up front, and then the subsequent uh, interest payments that come along with that. Typically, beginning June 6th, the penalty would kick in on those accounts, and then beginning the first of the next month, the interest would begin. So we've structured it so both would not kick in until the beginning of August. So it gives uh, taxpayers who may be uh, struggling with this particular bill an additional eight weeks plus uh, to to make those payments and uh, and give them a little bit more time. Hopefully, the the economy begins to uh, to pick back up. Uh, it also applies to business personal property, so there's some additional relief for our Chesterfield businesses here. But again, none of this applies to real estate taxes. Those still do June five with the standard uh, protocols for penalties and interest on real estate. This is just personal property, but it's still due, due June five. But payments received up through July 31st, which is a Friday, uh, will not be assessed penalties and interest. So, again, public hearing on your, uh, I think it's your last item tonight to consider the measures to uh, to put this in place. But uh, a lot of thanks to the board and to the treasurer again. Uh, Ms. Longnaker has worked very hard to, uh, to put together a, a protocol, a plan, program for this that does responsive to the feedback that we've heard from the community. Next slide. 
So let me just summarize because, again, that's a lot of information across a lot of topics. Um, you, on your consent agenda, you have the amendments to the county and school budget related to the state actions. Um, really nothing uh, major to report there. I think, you know, we've been able to put together uh, plans for you that uh, that will fit in with our, our what we, where we expect it to be. You have the amendment to the CDBG program related to their CARES funding. That's on consent as well. A consent item to set the public hearing on the court security fee for June, holding the public hearing on personal property relief measures, and then the capital and CARES discussions are phone calls, emails on those topics, more to come on those. There will be action items ahead of you on those topics, but tonight those are just informational. So that's just a quick recap of uh, everything that we just went through. And we go to the next go to the next slide. I think that's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Board members, do you have any questions for Mr. Harris? Madam Chair, Madam just Chair. one question. Matt, how is consumer confidence um, being measured uh, in Chesterfield? I note that the stock market is very high, but the national measures of consumer confidence seem to be, if, if not low, at their lowest point in years. What's your read on that, and how do we measure that in Chesterfield? No, um, Mr. Winslow, I, I appreciate that question. I, I think, you know, we don't have an official consumer confidence index uh, at, at the local level anywhere, but I think really through some of those non-traditional measures, looking at the activity about how people are going out and re-engaging in, uh, in the local economy, that's, that's going to be our best read on that. We won't get the April sales tax data for still from some time, but uh, we've, and I've got a, there's, tonight was just one of about half a dozen of these non-traditional measures that we're looking at. And I think that people's actions, you know, they vote with their feet. And I think when they're going out, driving, spending, all of those things, um, I think that speaks very loudly. And I think as the, the chart showed, even though it's a couple of days old, you know, we're starting to get close, back close to uh, traditional levels of activity, at least from a traffic perspective in the county, which I think speaks well that people are trying to get out and re-engage. You heard some positive uh, anecdotes from Mr. Hart as well that businesses were uh, well received at least on the restaurant front this uh, last two weekends so I think you know we feel like you know Chesterfield citizens and businesses are very resilient and we, we feel uh, you know cautiously optimistic about the data we have thus far. Thank you sir. Thank you. 